What's up, guys? Today, we're on Chapter 8 of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. That's 8 out of 10, so we're getting close. Although, this one's long, and of the remaining two, one of them is long as well. So, uh, it's not going to finish it all in one sitting, probably. So, I'm going to read this chapter, or at least a big chunk of it, and then I'm going to talk about the rest. We've got a couple classes left. Next time, I'm going to post a study guide with some questions over the whole thing to make sure it's all fresh in your mind and you know the basics and you remember the names. And then we'll have a day of uh, reviewing that, answering questions, etc. And then our final, our test will be on, let's see, I believe it's May 19th. Yeah, May 19th is the one for first period. So when it comes to finals and uh, exams, those are scheduled by the school because they don't want to have you take six in one day or something. So each period has its own slot. And the first period exams are on May 19th. For us, it's not really a final. Like this is just a test the same as the last one. So we took a test over the last story and we're taking a test over this story, but they're equal in importance. They're equal in points. So it's not like this one is worth a million and that one was not important anymore. They're equally important. And this is just the one that comes last, but it's not more. So let's get to it. Let's look at chapter eight. And as we go, we can stop and recap, uh, see what things mean, see what we're foreshadowing, make sure we're all understanding what's going on. As you can see from the little time in this bar at the top, this is longer. I think the last chapter, it said like three minutes to read. This one says 25. So they're really uneven in their uh, word count, you know. Mr. Utterson was sitting by his fireside one evening after dinner when he was surprised to receive a visit from Poole. Bless me, Poole, what brings you here? He cried, and then taking a second look at him, What ails you? he added. Is the doctor ill? Mr. Utterson said the man, there's something wrong. So remember, Poole is the, I don't know what the right word is. I, I think I said butler last time. That might not apply. But he's the assistant to Jekyll. And when you go to Jekyll's door, Poole is the one who answers and usually says, Nope, sorry, you can't come in. Utterson obviously has talked to him a lot. Take a seat, and here's a glass of wine for you. Now take your time and tell me plainly what you want. You know the doctor's ways, sir, and how he shuts himself up. Well, he's shut up again in the cabinet, and I don't like it. Sir, I wish I may die if I like it. Mr. Utterson, sir, I'm afraid. By the way, when they say cabinet, they've used this word a lot. It doesn't mean like, you know, when we say cabinet, I mean like the thing I keep the pencils in in the back of the room. This is a an area in this uh, surgery theater where uh, Jekyll had bought this place from a medical school. And so there's an area called the cabinet that's really more like, you know, a lab or something. Don't think of him as like, you know, hiding in the furniture. Now, my good man, said the lawyer, be explicit. What are you afraid of? I've been afraid for about a week and I can bear it no more. The man's appearance amply bore out his words. His manner was altered for the worse, except for the moment when he had first announced his terror. He had not looked once the lawyer in the face. Even now he sat with the glass of wine untasted on his knee, and his eye directed to a corner of the floor. I can bear it no more, he repeated. Come, I see you have good reason, Poole. I see there's something seriously amiss. Try to tell me what it is. I think there's been foul play. Foul play, cried the lawyer, a good deal frightened and rather inclined to be irritated in consequence. What foul play? What does the man mean? I daren't say, sir, but will you come along with me and see for yourself? Mr. Utterson's only answer was to rise and get his hat and greatcoat, but he observed with wonder the greatness of the relief that appeared upon the butler's face. Well, there you go. They used the word butler as well, so I wasn't too far off. And perhaps with no less, the wine was still untasted when he set it down to follow. It was a wild, cold, seasonable night of March, with a pale moon lying on her back as though the wind had tilted her and a flying rack of the most diaphanous and lawny texture. The wind made talking difficult and flecked the blood into the face. 
It seemed to have swept the streets unusually bare of passengers. Besides, for Mr. Utterson thought he had never seen that part of London so deserted. He could have wished it otherwise. Never in his life had he been conscious of so sharp a wish to see and touch his fellow creatures. For struggle as he might, there was born upon his mind a crushing anticipation of calamity. The square, when they got there, was all full of wind and dust, and the thin trees in the garden were lashing themselves along the railing. Poole, who had kept all the way a pace or two ahead, now pulled up in the middle of the pavement, and in spite of the biting weather, took off his hat and mopped his brow with a red pocket handkerchief. But for all the hurry of his cowing, these were not the dews of exertion that he wiped away, but the moisture of some strangling anguish, for his face was white, and his voice, when he spoke, harsh and broken. At the beginning of this paragraph, they describe the weather and the scene and the atmosphere. And whenever that happens, you know it's going to be bad. They did that in the beginning when the girl got injured. They did that when the uh, rich man was killed. They always do that before something is about to be revealed as a crime or a death or something. Well, sir, here we are. And God grant there be nothing wrong. I'm in, Poole. Thereupon the servant knocked in a very garden manner. The door was open on the chain, and a voice asked from within, Is that you, Poole? It's all right. Open the door. The hall, when they entered it, was brightly lighted up. The fire was built high, and about the hearth, the whole of the servants, men and women, stood huddled together like a flock of sheep. At the sight of Mr. Utterson, the housemaid broke into hysterical whimpering, and the cook, crying out, Bless God, it's Mr. Utterson, ran forward as if to take him in her arms. What, what, are you all here, said the lawyer. Very irregular, very unseemly, your master would be far from pleased. They're all afraid, said Poole. Blank silence followed, no one protesting. Only the maid lifted up her voice and now wept loudly. Hold your tongue, Poole said to her with a ferocity of accent that testified to his own jangled nerves. And indeed, when the girl had so suddenly raised the note of her lamentation that they had all startled and turned toward the inner door with faces of dreadful expectation. And now, continued the butler, addressing the knife boy, reach me a candle, and we'll get this through hands at once. And then he begged Mr. Utterson to follow him and led the way to the back garden. So they brought Utterson to this situation, and they all know something's wrong. And all the servants are gathered together, which apparently doesn't happen otherwise. And Poole is the only one who's taking charge and saying, all right, we're going to deal with this. We're going to see what's up. He doesn't really think it can be fixed, but at least he thinks they can. Take a look, get a, get the uh, get the view of the situation, and uh, you know, face it. Now, sir, you come as gently as you can. I want you to hear, and I don't want you to be heard. See here, sir. If by any chance he was to ask you in, don't go. Again, and I've mentioned this a few times. It really sounds like they're treating Jekyll like an addict, like he's in drugs or alcohol. And they're saying, like, don't listen to him. If he invites you in, don't do it. Um, you know, he's, he's sort of, he's relapsed. You know, he's in this mode where, you know, we want to help him, but we don't want to actually do what he wants in the moment. Mr. Utterson's nerves at this unlooked for termination gave a jerk that nearly threw him from his balance. But he recollected his courage and followed the butler into the laboratory building and through the surgical theater with its lumber of crates and bottles to the foot of the stair. Here Poole motioned him to stand on one side and listen, while he himself, setting down the candle and making a great and obvious call on his resolution, mounted the steps and knocked with a somewhat uncertain hand on the red baize of the cabinet door. Mr. Utterson, sir, asking to see you, he called, and even as he did so, once more violently signed to the lawyer to give ear. A voice answered from within, tell him I cannot see anyone said complainingly. Thank you, sir, said Poole, with a note of something like triumph in his voice, and taking up his candle, he led Mr. Utterson back across the yard and into the great kitchen, where the fire was out and the beetles were leaping on the floor. So Utterson was there in order to hear that. Poole was like, come on, let me demonstrate what I'm talking about. And so he knocked and said the name, and he wanted Utterson to hear Jekyll's voice, but he didn't actually want Utterson to play along and go in there or talk to him or anything. He was just saying, let's do a little experiment. Let me show you what he sounds like. Sir, he said, looking Mr. Utterson in the eyes, was that my master's voice? 
There seems much change, replied the lawyer, very pale, but giving look for look. Change? Well, yes, I think so. Have I been twenty years in this man's house to be deceived about his voice? No, sir, master's made away with. He was made away with eight days ago, when we heard him cry out upon the name of God. And who's in there instead of him? And why it stays there is a thing that cries to heaven, Mr. Utterson. This is a very strange tale, Poole. This is rather a wild tale, my man. Suppose it were as you uh, suppose. Supposing Dr. Jekyll to have been, well, murdered. What can induce the murderer to stay? That won't hold water. It doesn't commend itself to reason. So Poole thinks it's a, you know, Little Red Riding Hood situation where that's not the same guy anymore. It's the big bad wolf in disguise. They haven't said it, but they both kind of have this idea that oh, it must be Hyde, right? Because who else is a dangerous man that deals with Jekyll? Well, Mr. Utterson, you are a hard man to satisfy, but I'll do it yet. All this last week, you must know him, or it, or whatever it is that lives in that cabinet, has been crying night and day for some sort of medicine and cannot get it to his mind. It was sometimes his way, the master's that is, to write his orders on a sheet of paper and throw it on the stair. We've had nothing else this week back, nothing but papers and a closed door, and the very meals left there to be smuggled in when nobody was looking. Well, sir, every day, I, twice and thrice in the same day, there have been orders and complaints, and I've been sent flying to all the wholesale chemists in town. Every time I brought this stuff back, there would be another paper telling me to return it, because it was not pure, and another, or another order to a different firm. This drug is wanted bitter bad, sir, whatever for. So again, this metaphor that it's a drug addiction is like, uh, you know, Jekyll is trying, or whoever is in there, is trying to synthesize something he needs and that can't be found anywhere else. Have you any of these papers? asked Mr. Utterson. Poole felt in his pocket and handed out a crumpled note, which the lawyer, bending nearer to the candle, carefully examined. Its contents ran thus. Dr. Jekyll presents his compliments to Monsieur Ma. He offers them that their last sample is impure and quite useless for his present purpose. In the year 18, blah, 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 Dr. J purchased a somewhat large quantity from Messrs. M. Okay, so this M-E-S-S-R-S is the, the plural of Mr. It's uh, the French Messier, and it's what you address if you're talking to multiple uh, gentlemen. And the, the Ma or the M is a shortened version of their last name, so this must be like a family pharmacy of the mall, whatever family. He now begs them to search with his most sedulous care, and should any of the same quality be left, to forward it to him at once. Expense is no consideration. The importance of this to Dr. J can hardly be exaggerated. So far the letter had run composedly enough, but here with the sudden splutter of the pen, the writer's emotion had broken loose. For God's sake, he had added, find me some of the old. So he's trying to requisition this material, but by the end he's like, come on, man, give me some of that good stuff. And we really don't know what it is, but we have a feeling of the kind of thing it is, even if we don't know the details, right? This is a strange note, said Mr. Utterson. How do you come to have it open? So the idea is that maybe it was supposed to be sealed in an envelope and Poole was never supposed to see it. But the man at Malls was main angry, sir, and threw it back at me like so much dirt. This is unquestionably the doctor's hand, do you know? I thought it looked like it. But what matters, hand of right? I've seen him. Seen him? Well, that's it. It was this way. I came suddenly into the theater from the garden. It seems he had slipped out to look for this drug or whatever it is, for the cabinet door was open. And there he was at the far end of the room digging among the crates. He looked up when I came in, gave a kind of cry, and whipped upstairs to the cabinet. It was but for one minute that I saw him, but the hair stood upon my head like quills. Sir, if that was my master, why had he had a mask upon his face? If it was my master, why did he cry out like a rat and run from me? I have served him long enough. And then, these are all very strange circumstances, but I think I begin to see daylight. Your master pool is plainly seized with one of those maladies that both torture and deform the sufferer. Hence, for aught I know, the alteration of his voice. Hence, the mask and the avoidance of his friends. Hence, his eagerness to find this drug by means of which the poor soul retains some hope of ultimate recovery. God grant that he be not deceived. There's my explanation. It is sad enough, Poole, I, and appalling to consider, but it is plain and natural. Hangs well together and delivers us all from exorbitant alarms. 
So Utterson says he must have some kind of disease that is like physically deforming him and he doesn't want to be seen because he's hideous and he doesn't want to, you know, trouble his friends and he doesn't want to uh, shame himself. But it is the same guy, Utterson thinks. Sir, that thing was not my master. And here's the truth. My master is a tall, fine build of a man and this is more of a dwarf. Oh, sir, do you think I know not my master after 20 years? Do you think I do not know where his head comes in the cabinet door, where I saw him every morning in my life? No, sir, that thing in the mask was never Dr. Jekyll. God knows what it was, but it was never Dr. Jekyll, and it is the belief in my heart that there was murder done. Cool. If you say that, it will become my duty to make certain. Much as I desire to spare your master's feelings, much as I am puzzled by this note which seems to prove him to be still alive, I, can, I shall consider it my duty to break in that door. Ah, Mr. Utterson, that's talking. And now comes the second question. Who's going to do it? Why, you and me. That's very well said, and whatever comes of it, I shall make it my business to see you are no loser. There is an axe in the theater, and you might take the kitchen poker for yourself. So they, they're going to do a... Uh, Jack Nicholson in The Shining, and they're going to chop through the door and see what's in there. Is it really Jekyll? Is he just uh, changed by some disease where he looks different and sounds different, but still has the same handwriting? Or has he been killed and has been replaced by some imposter? The lawyer took that rude but weighty instrument into his hand and balanced it. Do you know, Poole, that you and I are about to place ourselves in a position of some peril? You may say so, sir, indeed. It is well, then, that we should be frank. We both think more than we have said. Let us make a clean breast. This masked figure that you saw, did you recognize it? Well, sir, it went so quick, and the creature was so doubled up that I could hardly swear to that. But if you mean, was it Mr. Hyde? Why, yes, I think it was. You see, it was much the same bigness, and had not the same quick, light way with it. And then who else could have got in by the laboratory door? You have not forgot, sir, that at the time of the murder, he still had the key with him. But that's not all. I don't know, Mr. Utterson, if ever you met this Mr. Hyde. Yes, I once spoke with him. Then you must know as well as the rest of us that there was something queer about that gentleman. Something that gave a man a turn. I don't know rightly how to say it. Beyond this, that you felt in your marrow kind of cold and thin. I own I felt something of what you describe. Quite so, sir. Well, then, when that masked thing, like a monkey, jumped from among the chemicals and whipped into the cabinet, it went down my spine like ice. Oh, I know it's not evidence. I'm book learned enough for that. But a man has his feelings, and I give you my Bible word it was, Mr. Hyde. Aye, aye. My fears incline to the same point. Evil, I fear, found it. Evil was sure to come of that connection. I truly, I believe you. I believe poor Harry is killed, and I believe his murderer for what purpose God alone can tell is still lurking in the victim's room. Well, let our name be Vengeance. Call Bradshaw. Now, this is a name we haven't heard yet, but we know this must be serious if they're calling this this new guy. The footman came at the summons, very white and nervous. Pull yourself together, Bradshaw, said the lawyer. The suspense, I know, is telling upon all of you, but it is now our intention to make an end of it. Poole here and I, Poole here and I are going to force our way into the cabinet. If all is well, my shoulders are broad enough to bear the blame. Meanwhile, lest anything should be really amiss, or any malefactor seek to escape by the back, you and the boy must go round the corner with a pair of good sticks and take your post at the laboratory door. We give you ten minutes to get to your stations. As Bradshaw left, the lawyer looked at his watch. And now, Poole, let us get to ours. Taking the poker under his arm, he led his way into the yard. The scud had banked over the moon, and it was now quite dark. The wind, which broke only in puffs and drafts into that deep well of building, tossed the light of the candle to and fro about their steps, till they came into the shelter of the theater, where they sat down silently to wait. London hummed silent, solemnly all around, but nearer at hand, the stillness was only broken by the sounds of footfall moving to and fro along the cabinet floor. So it will walk all day, sir, I in the better part of the night. Only when a new sample comes from the chemist, there's a bit of a break. Ah, it's an ill conscience that's such an enemy to rest. Ah, sir, there's blood foully shed in every step of it. But hark again a little closer. Put your heart in my ears, Mr. Utterson, and tell me, is that the doctor's foot? I don't know if you feel the same, but often if you 
live with somebody, you can notice their footsteps. You know, if you're in your bedroom and you hear mom coming down the stairs or something, you can identify who's who just by the rhythm and weight of those steps. And this guy is saying, look, you hear that. Is that Jekyll? Come on, it's somebody else. The steps fell lightly and oddly with a certain swing. For all they went so slowly, it was so different indeed from the heavy creaking tread of Henry Jekyll. Utterson sighed. Is there never anything else? Once, once I heard it weeping. Weeping, how that? Weeping like a woman or a lost soul. I came away with that upon my heart, but I could have wept too. But now the ten minutes drew to an end. Poole disinterred the axe from under a stack of packing straw. The candle was set upon the nearest table to light them to the attack. And they drew near with bated breath to see where that patient foot was still going up and down, up and down in the quiet of the night. Jekyll, cried Utterson with a loud voice, I demand to see you. He paused a moment, but there came no reply. I give you fair warning. Our suspicions are aroused, and I must and shall see you. If not by fair means, then by foul. If not of your consent, then by brute force. Utterson, said the voice, for God's sake, have mercy. Ah, that's not Jekyll's voice. It's Hyde's. Down to the door, Poole. Poole swung the axe over his shoulder. The blow shook the building, and the red bay's door leaped against the lock and hinges. A dismal screech as of mere animal terror rang from the cabinet. Up went the axe again and again till the panels crashed and the frame bounded. Four times the blow fell, but the wood was tough, and the fittings were of excellent workmanship. And it was not until the fifth that the lock burst in sunder and the wreck of the door fell inwards on the carpet. The besiegers, appalled by their own riot and the stillness that had succeeded, stood back a little and peered in. There lay the cabinet before their eyes in the quiet lamplight, a good fire glowing and shattering on the hearth, the kettle singing its thin strain, a drawer or two open, papers neatly set forth on the business table, and nearer the fire the things laid out for tea. The quietest room, you would have said, and but for the glazed presses full of chemicals, the most commonplace that night in London. Right in the midst there lay the body of a man, sorely contorted and still twitching. They drew near on tiptoe, turned it on its back, and beheld the face of Edward Hyde, he was dressed in clothes far too large for him, clothes of the doctor's bigness. The cords of his face still moved with a semblance of life, but life was quite gone. And by the crushed vial and the big hand and the strong smell of kernels that hung upon the air, Utterson knew that he was looking on the body of a self-destroyer. We've come too late. Whether save or punish Hyde has gone to his account, and it only rains for us to find the body of your master. So what they think is that Hyde must have killed Jackal, Hyde must have been in there for a while, and when they were breaking in the door, he drank some poison and killed himself. That's what they currently uh, suspect. The far greater proportion of the building was occupied by the theater, which filled almost the whole ground story and was lighted from above, and by the cabinet, which formed an upper story at one end and looked upon the court. A corridor joined the theater to the door on the by street, and with this, the cabinet communicated separately by a second flight of stairs. There were beside a few dark closets and a spacious cellar. All these they now thoroughly examined. Each closet needed but a glance, for all were empty, and all by the dust that fell from the doors had stood long and open. The cellar, indeed, was filled with crazy lumber, mostly dating from the times of the surgeon who was Jekyll's predecessor. But even as they opened the door, they were advertised of the uselessness of further search. By the fall of a perfect mat of cobweb, cobweb which has for years sealed up the entrance, nowhere was there any trace of Henry Jekyll, dead or alive. Poole stamped the flags of the corridor. He must be buried here, he said, hearkening to the sound. Or he may have fled, said Utterson, and he turned to examine the door in the by street. It was locked, and lying near on by the flags, they found the key already stained with rust. This does not look like use. Use? Do you not see, sir, it is broken, much as if a man had stamped on it? I and the fractures, too, are rusty. This is beyond me, Poole. Let us go back to the cabinet. So Poole thinks maybe he killed Jekyll and buried him. Maybe a slight reference to Telltale Heart, uh, at least for readers now who are looking back and thinking of that as a popular story of around the same time of a man who killed, you know, his uh, master and buried him in the floor. They mounted the stair in silence and still with an occasional awestruck glance at the dead body, proceeded more thoroughly to examine all the contents of the cabinet. 
at one table, there were traces of chemical work, various measured heaps of some white salt being laid upon glass saucers, as though for an experiment in which the unhappy man had, prevented, had been prevented. That is the same drug I was always bringing him. And even as he spoke, the kettle with a startling noise boiled over. This brought them to the fireside, where the easy chair was drawn cozily up, and the tea things... Hang on, just zooming ahead to see how much we got left. The tea things stood ready to the sitter's elbow, the very sugar in the cup. There were several books on a shelf. One lay beside the tea things open, and Utterson was amazed to find it a copy of the pious work, for which Jekyll had several times expressed a great esteem, annotated in his own hand, starting blasphemies. So what they're noticing is that it's got lots of normal stuff. It's like, oh, a nice cozy chair with some tea and a thing of sugar. Uh, but then there's also drugs, and then there's also startling blasphemies, meaning he's written in this pious work, some kind of, you know, religious or uh, philosophical text, just horrible profanities or whatever, uh, you know, negative sentiments. Next, in the course of the review of the chamber, the searchers came to this, I'm not sure how they pronounce this, there's a cheval in French is, uh, where that means horse, so maybe I can look that up. Cheval glass, what does that mean? It's a mirror. It's one of those mirrors that has like a tilt that you can move at any angle. Okay. Into whose depths they looked with an involuntary horror. But it was so turned as if to show them nothing but the rosy glow playing on the roof, the fire sparking in a hundred repetitions along the glazed front of the presses, and their own pale and powerful, fearful countenances stopping to look in. This glass has seen some strange things, sir, and surely none stranger than itself. For what did Jekyll, what would Jekyll want with it? You may say that. Next, they turned to the business table. On the desk among the neat array of papers, a large envelope was uppermost and bore in the doctor's hand the name of Mr. Utterson. The lawyer unsealed it. Several enclosures fell to the floor. First was a will, drawn in the same eccentric terms as the one which he had returned six months before, to serve as a testament in case of death, and as indeed a gift in case of disappearance. But in place of the name Edward Hyde, the lawyer, with indescribable amazement, read the name of Gabriel John Utterson. He looked at Poole and then back at the paper, and last of all, the dead malefactor stretched upon the carpet. My head goes round, he said. He has been all these days in possession. He had no cause to like me. He must have raged to see himself displaced and he's not destroyed this document. He caught the next paper. It was a brief note in the doctor's hands and dated at the top. Brief note in the doctor's hand, meaning handwriting. Oh, Poole, he was alive and here this day. He cannot have been disposed of in so short a space. He must be still alive. He must have fled. And then why fled and how? And in that case, can we venture to declare this suicide? Oh, we must be careful. I foresee that we may yet involve your master in some dire catastrophe. Why don't you read it, sir? Because I fear, God grant, I have no cause for it. And with that, he brought to the paper his eyes and read as follows. So they found a will that's the same as before, except the earlier one said, hey, if I disappear, give everything to Hyde. This one changed it to Utterson. So if they were following along and they didn't know the future, they might think, oh, maybe uh, Hyde got mad at Jekyll for changing this. And maybe Hyde was kind of trying to kill him to, uh, you know, dispose of that will and go back to the old one and inherit everything. My dear Utterson, when this shall fall into your hands, I shall have disappeared. Under what circumstances I have not the penetration to foresee. But my instinct and all the circumstances in my nameless situation tell me that the end is sure. It must be early. Go then and first read the narrative which Lanyon warned me he was to place in your hands. And if you care to hear more, turn to the confession of your unworthy and unhappy friend, Henry Jekyll. There was a third enclosure. Here, sir. The lawyer put it in his pocket. I would say nothing of this paper. If your master is fled or is dead, we may at least save his credit. It is now 10. I must go home and read these documents in quiet, but I shall be back before midnight when we shall send for the police. They went out, locking the door of the theater behind them, and Utterson once more leaving the servants gathered about the fire in the hall trudged back to his office to read the two narratives in which this mystery was now to be explained. So we just had a big chapter, a lot of stuff happened. And if we in the future have heard of the, 
you know, premise of this story. We know what's going on, which is that Hot, Jekyll and Hyde are not the same person, but they have the same body. So one transforms into the other. And that if Jekyll transformed into Hyde and then died, well, apparently Jekyll's dead too. And uh, definitely they're not going to find him. But did they know about that? Did Jekyll have some weird plans of maybe, you know, surviving if Hyde didn't? We don't know for sure. And he's going to read the notes that Jekyll left and the note that Lanyon left that he still hadn't opened and try to figure out what's going on. The problem is, this is so strange for Utterson. When he learns it, he's going to be so, you know, shocked and bewildered and maybe not believe it at first. So he might get into trouble from there. That was a big chapter. I just read a long thing. If you listen to this whole video, I appreciate it. So your assignment is just to read the rest. I don't have any questions for you because I'm going to have a big batch of questions next time. You guys read the rest. We have one medium chapter and then the one long one. Nine is, nine is normal, 10 is long. And next time we'll have a study guide. Time after that we'll review it. Time after that we'll take our test. If you're a senior, we got to do the grades right after that because the senior grades are due early. If you're not a senior, we have a couple more days to finalize stuff and you might do makeups and retakes and that kind of thing. So we got our plan. Let's do it. And I'll end this video now.